and why we went into Vietnam and how we got out of it. But my name is Richard White. I, I'm born and raised in Baton Rouge area. I live in Central now. Uh, but uh, I joined the Marine Corps in 1961, right out of high school. A bunch of guys that went camping. I did roll at LSU and a uh, bunch of guys went camping. I graduated with Sitting Bull Falls, New Mexico. And uh, I had an accident out there, broke both my ankles. So needless to say, I didn't start LSU and, uh, when I should have. So all my friends had started and I said, well, I'll just go ahead and get my service time over with. So I joined the Marines at that time. And I ended up spending uh, right at five years in the Marines. Uh, I signed up for four. And then when things started heating up overseas, I extended my time for six months. And then when they sent me to Vietnam, uh, the government extended me an extra four months. <laughs> so I ended up putting uh, six years and ten months in there. I mean, four years and ten months, I'm oh, sorry. But anyway, uh, I went to Vietnam in uh, July, June 16th of 1965 was when we landed there. We came off of a ship, came down nets like you see in the old war movies and got on the PT boats and uh, landing craft and went in. Uh, fortunately, we were prepared, but there wasn't nothing going on on the beach, so we were very fortunate. But uh, I told Adam when he was at the house, uh, it's a weird feeling. You prepare all your life, all your time in the Marines to, to go to battle and, uh, and, and fight. And uh, when they started handing out the ammunition aboard the ship, there was no feeling in the world like that. It, it was for real. They were handing out hand grenades and live ammunition, whereas before you may have had uh, some blanks of ammo and you never fooled with hand grenades at all unless you were in a, uh, in a setting where you had trainers there with you to handle them. But uh, this here, they were handing out live hand grenades. And uh, that, that's the most butterflies I've ever had in my whole life. It was really tough. But anyway, we made it through that. We made it to the landing. And when we first got to Vietnam, our main thing was security at the Da Nang Air Base. And we sat there and set up security. We had little short patrols around the base, but nothing, nothing major. And uh, it was a fairly secure area, but there was really no secure area in Vietnam. We did have a couple guys that got hurt, stepped on landmines. There was a lot of that over there. And uh, so after that, we took off and we went out and we patrolled. And the, at first, the Vietnam wanted just the Orvin soldiers. That's the Army of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese soldiers to do everything around the bases because of uh, uh, the, VC, the population was so heavy in that area. But anyway, we started going out on the patrols too. And uh, it's just hard to explain how things are over there. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, most people think with the, the bullets and the booby traps and things like that, they bad. And we lost a lot of, I probably lost half my platoon before I left there. But that was the living conditions under what all these, it's just unbelievable. Your clothes rot off, your, uh, your boots fall apart, you know. It, and this ain't just happened in Vietnam. This happened in all wars. When you see these men, uh, and I'm actually right now, whenever you see a veteran, thank him, especially a combat veteran. He's, he has seen it all, so it's tough. But they do it for a reason. They love their country. Like 
and there's no other country in the world like this. Uh, you, people who live in America don't realize what they got here. You know, it's uh, it's just unbelievable when you see how other countries live. But uh, this here I brought, this is just something, this is an old mess kit that y'all probably all seen them anyway, but in Vietnam, this is what you ate out of if, if you was in a, got a hot meal every now and then. But this right here is the key to, su to survival in Vietnam. <laughs> this is a sea ration opener. It opens all your, your cans of food that you got in the field. So, and these things here work great. Most people don't know it, but that's what they for, open that sea ration. But, and I've got some pictures that I want to pass around. And y'all can just take a glance at them and see what y'all think about them. You go at them, you pass these around. And as you look at them, if you got a question about them, just, just ask me about it. I'll be glad to answer anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Those are just pictures from over there that well, I go to reunions about every other year, and I've been doing it for about the past 20 years. I still stay in touch with probably 12 or 15 guys that I serve with that uh, after 50 years, you know, we still stay in touch. It's a camaraderie that you build when you serving with guys and protecting each other. It's something I love every one of them. And I can say that to them, and I can say that to you, and they were all men, but there's no greater love than that love that for that fellow man that's watching your back. So, you know, it's, uh, I stay, like I say, I stay in touch with all of them and love them all and they love me. So that's important. And I got a picture of a few of them in those that's passing around there. We, uh, there was a mountain in the area where we were at. It was called Marble Mountain. And that's mainly where we worked at was in the Marble Mountain area. And in one of the pictures, you'll see it, the mountain. And we didn't realize it back then, but the, the Viet Cong actually had a, a tunnel under that mountain. And they had, where well, they had a hospital under there and uh, food and cafeterias and uh, places where they stayed at. About halfway up the mountain, there was a, a, a monk monastery up there. And in that monastery uh, area, they had a huge cave and a big Buddha in that cave. And it's, it's hard to believe that that Buddha was up halfway up that mountain like that and in that cave and there was a light that a hole up in the top of the mountain and the light shined through but we had a listening post up there uh, I don't know what we was listening for way up there <laughs> wasn't nothing going on on the mountain but but anyway it uh, we had a a great experience in, in being there there was a it was a political war more than anything and I tell people that and uh, you know we we went over there with all the good intentions in the world to, to, to stop the spread of communism in in Vietnam uh, they had fought over there for years and years the French and then the Japanese came in and took over the country but uh, then we moved in and uh, I'll tell you, uh, the politicians in this country, uh, well, it was bad. <laughs> uh, I, I had no respect whatsoever for President Johnson at the time. I think he prolonged our time in Vietnam. Uh, he tried to run the war from Washington, D.C. You couldn't do that. You know, it, it didn't let the generals do 
do what they were supposed to do, or the, or the fighting men. Uh, mostly when we was over there, we, we worked in small units. Most of the time it was either a squad uh, or something like that. We would, you went over as a battalion and then you would separate and most of the time it was 10 or 12 guys on patrols. Uh, so we were, we were very fortunate that we could watch each other because, like I said, the, uh, the politicians were, weren't the best. McNamara, he was probably the next worst guy. Uh, he may even top Johnson. He was, he was a, my wife always said, you got intelligent people, but intelligent people ain't necessarily smart people. And that was what these guys were. They were intelligent, but they weren't smart, you know. So uh, she had a, made a good sense there. <coughs> but anyway, uh, it was some, some tough times, but we survived it all. Uh, I would not give up that experience for nothing. It, it taught you uh, how to survive and, and how to trust your fellow man. Uh, I know in one of the pictures, I had uh, one, one black guy in my squad. His name was Robert Brown. He was one of my fire team leaders. People ask me sometimes about how the race relations were. We never had problems. Never, and that was in 1965, which was, uh, it's, I think the race relations were starting to get bad in 63 or 64, I'm not sure when, but in, when you're in combat and watching out for each other, it don't matter what color your skin is, it's just, you're looking out for each other. So, and I know they did have some problems later, drugs. You hear a lot about drugs over there. I never, I never saw any drugs over there. I don't doubt they may have had some, but uh, like I said, I, I never had to deal with any. We were, we were tickled to death when the helicopters came in and dropped us a couple hot beers every now and then. You know, so I mean, that was, that was our treat was getting that hot beer. But uh, as far as uh, and then we went out on an operation one time, was out I guess about six weeks, and uh, we went out on the operation with just uh, rifles and a, what they call a light marching pack, which was uh, you carried an extra pair of socks, extra pair of underwear, and just some, uh, maybe a can of sea rations or something. But anyway, while we was out there, we ended up, we were supposed to be going for a few days and we was out there for six weeks. And by the time we got back in, everything on us was rotted. And so the uh, helicopters would drop off uh, our mail, ammo, and uh, food, sea rations. But the sea rations actually sustained all of us. We, we lived through it. So it wasn't the best stuff, but we made it. And I'll tell you what, uh, my first guy, I don't know the way the pictures is that, they had a guy in there, and uh, he was the first man in my squad that got wounded. And it's something that ate on me for a long time. Uh, I, I was telling Adam about it the other day, and he, uh, but he, he survived, and, but I blame myself a lot of times for it, you know, I was, supposed to be the guy that protected these other guys. I was the squad leader over there. And I had uh, 10 other guys in my squad. But uh, we got caught in a couple of ambushes over there. So it wasn't, it was almost impossible to stay out of the ambushes to be truthful with you. We never fought any big battles. Uh, in the area we worked in was snipers and booby traps mostly. But I can tell you one thing, it was hairy every day. Every day that you set foot in that soil over there, you could lose your life. 
and I'm sure it was like that in a lot of other places, you know, in different wars. Uh, I think of Korea and uh, the, 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 that fight there with the guys fighting in below freezing temperatures for days and on end, and you know, and that was tough. Uh, for us, it was rain and uh, we were actually at night and I was telling Adam at night the the uh, the darkness in Vietnam was total darkness. If there wasn't no moon and sun that night, I mean <laughs> moon and stars that night, it was unbelievable. You you held on to the man in front of you, or you would lose him. It just was complete total darkness. There was no electricity. It's ain't we take all this for granted that area we worked in, the people lived in grass huts. They had just a mattress for a bed. They cooked their food outside most of the time on campfires. And so at night when you went on a patrol, it was tough. You, you, we had a compass that we used and it had a illuminated dial in it so you could tell which way you're going. But, uh, and it would, if you had ambushes, the, the, and it was raining so hard you couldn't see your hand in front of your face anyway, uh, you would just sit there and shiver. It was so cold. You wouldn't, you don't think of cold in Vietnam, but it was very cold. But uh, we, like I said, you were scared that somebody would hear your teeth rattling, you know, so. But anyway, as the, as the things are passed around, anybody got some questions, anything? What was in your sea rations, like what was it? Well, sea rations were different types. You had, uh, it was all canned goods, <laughs> but uh, you had uh, a meat one, you had pork and beans, you had some spaghetti, uh, but this ain't, it's kind of like, what is it like? Not like ravioli. It's, it's a ravioli is a treat. This stuff here was, and uh, in it you you'd get a little pack of cigarettes, and uh, it was either I think four. If it was an unfiltered cigarette, you got four, five, and if it was a filtered cigarette in there, you got four. And they were they were so old that the cigarettes when you opened the pack they were brown. I mean, they were World War II cigarettes, but there was leftover sea rations from World War II. But uh, you got a little piece of pound cake normally in there, or a little can of fruit cocktail. Those were the small cans. Uh, they had ham and lima beans, and I can't say what we call those. <laughs> uh, and it's not appropriate. But anyway, <laughs> it was bad stuff. But every now and then, people there was a few people that liked the ham and lima beans, and they would, you would trade off for it. But certain ones, people like different things, you know. So I never could, never did gain a taste for them, though. Oh, I got a couple things. I'm gonna, I don't want to ask questions. One thing I want to ask right now was uh, with the news coverage of it, the story. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, early in. August of 65, uh, we were, we went into a village and uh, this village had been swept two or three times before and uh, the, the companies that had swept the village had taken some pretty bad casualties. So we came in on Amtrak's, which is big, um, track vehicles that we could either ride in or ride on top of to get to the area. But as soon as we got off the Amtrak's and started online, we started taking fire from the village and had three or four guys got knocked out quick. And uh, so anyway, our captain had told us, he said, if we take fire and take casualties, we're gonna destroy the village. And so we went in and we started destroying the village. And while I said destroy, we weren't destroying the people. People, we were there to protect people, not kill people. But anyway, we burned, started burning the huts and stuff. 
because the villagers were concealing these people and they wasn't they weren't helping us and they weren't helping themselves but I know they was in a bad situation over there you know they were damned if they do and damned if they don't so but anyway on this particular sweep that we call it a search and destroy uh, we had Morley Safe up with us he was a CBS newsman and uh, he he kind of gave us a, a real bad write up, said that we'd kill some innocent people, uh, had burned all their homes, which we did. We burnt the homes. But he didn't tell the whole story, and it went on the national news at home. And uh, it was, uh, it really turned people off against the, the, the veterans over there that were fighting. And uh, he didn't say that two or three times before that men had went through the village and, and had gotten killed over there. He didn't say nothing about that. He just told, chose to told, uh, tell what was happening with us. And like I said, even as we got on the Amtrak to leave after we had swept through the village, we started taking fire as we were getting on the Amtrak. So, these Vietnamese, uh, Viet Cong, had dug tunnels and stuff all throughout that village and they were hiding in that village in the, in the tunnels. And it was almost impossible to find the tunnels. So, uh, we, even though we destroyed all the huts that was on top of the ground, they were still there firing at us. So, but anyway, by him putting that on the news in the United States here, it uh, it cut us a lot of flack over there, so, and I I still to this day blame a lot of our problems over there on the news media, just like the news media is today. You know, you can I take news media with a grain of sand. It's you never know. So. Don't got any questions. I know people when they came back that they were like a lot of some of them weren't treated right. Did you have any like negative experiences? Yeah, I I was very fortunate that I was in the early part when I came home. There was no homecoming, no no celebration, but my family was there, and that was the most important thing, of course. But uh, uh, my son came home. He was in the Marines and came home from Desert Storm, and. We must have had 200 people at the airport to meet him when he came home. So, uh, to me, when I came home, it was indifference. Nobody, nobody really questioned me about what I did or what went on over there. It was like I never was there, you know. So, I mean, they just, uh, and later on, they still had some real bad protests and stuff. but. Uh, like I said, I was fortunate in, that I got to come home a little early, but like I said, nobody ever, even the service organizations, one of these patches here, this Vietnam Veterans of America, I, I belong to this organization here, I belong to the Marine Corps League and the Disabled Veterans Association, I'm a life member of those three, and uh, we never were invited to join the American Legion or the VFW. Nobody ever approached me about joining them, which is, I know you folks are young and don't know, but I mean, that's, that's, that's part of the camaraderie of the services is that these organizations come and, and get you enlisted in their organization. Nobody ever approached me on that. And so that's why this organization started, Vietnam Veterans of America. They said, well, if none of the other ones is going to invite us to join, we'll start our own. And that's what we did. And it's still going today. Uh, but now, the American Legion and VFW have, have changed their ways, so to speak, and uh, there's a lot of Vietnam veterans in both of those organizations. Anybody else? Go ahead. Anything. How often did the helicopter 
Rogers come by and drop stuff off the uh, fairly regular. <laughs> we rolled in a lot of them and they came in and, and gave us a lot of help and uh, they, we were fortunate in that we never fought against any heavy units, so to speak. Uh, up in the northern part of Vietnam, Brown uh, Way and uh, Khe San, which was one of the big battles up there, <coughs> helicopters were used exclusively. The Army probably used more helicopters than we did. And uh, I know y'all too young to remember, but in 1965, when we were there, uh, they had a, a tremendous battle. Uh, oh, I can't think of the name. It was, the, the, it, was a, um, it was an Army outfit, and they really got waxed bad. Uh, right at the beginning of the war, and uh, they were they were a helicopter unit. They came in in helicopters and uh, went out in helicopters. They but they were they were they got put into a bad situation and got ambushed and and really got hurt bad. They lost a couple hundred guys, so it was a bad situation. But helicopters were good. Believe me, when you needed them, <laughs> I was evacuated in one, so I was very happy for it. Oh, was the training hard? The training? Unbelievable. <laughs> Tell me about it. How was it? What was, like, what did you have to do? Well, I, I, was stayed, I stayed a grunt for the whole time that I was in the service. A grunt's an infantry man. Uh, this, I never realized there were so many different MOSs. That's a, your military occupation specialty. I, I thought the Marines was just grunts, you know. I thought everybody was a grunt. But there's, in Vietnam, uh, you have 259, almost 300 million people that served there. Of those 300, I mean 3 million people, of them 3 million people, only about maybe 300,000 of them, 10%, actually fought in combat. You have, you had bartenders over there, you had guys running clubs, you had uh, communicators, you had just anything that you can, most of them were support people. Uh, People don't realize how much support it takes to, to feed and take care of all these guys in the field. And, uh, but my training, <coughs> before we went to Vietnam, we actually went through a, what they call a Raider School. And we were supposed to, we done helicopter repelling, we were repelled out of helicopters, we were repelled out of, off of cliffs, we done scuba diving, we done rubber raft training where we got on a paddle out at night and got on a submarine and came in and climbed a cliff and rescued a bunch of people and came back down and got on the, the raft and went back out to the sub. There was an area in Okinawa called the Northern Training Area. Unbelievable, unbelievable the terrain and the conditions there that you trained on. It was we done escape and evasion there where they would actually put you in a sweat box and lock you up and you had to escape from it and, and survive on your own for two or three days. So we were well trained and I was so very thankful for that that I had good training before we went to Vietnam because a lot of the guys in the younger, the younger guys at the end of the time was really struggling with, because uh, they didn't have the training we had. I think somebody wants to come in. Uh, anybody else? But, well, I can't hear you. At the start of this, you said the reason you enlisted when you did is because you did get to the LSU in time after you had an accident. Had you enrolled in LSU and stayed there, do you think you still would have enlisted? They would have what now? Going to college. Would you 
Uh, no. Uh, maybe I, later I would have after I flunked out of LSU. <laughs> I never was a great student. <laughs> but uh, I, I actually enrolled at LSU to, to become a history teacher. That's what I wanted to be, a history teacher. So, uh, but uh, under the circumstances, I, I, had, I had two friends that had already been and joined the Marines when I joined. Uh, and then after that, two of the guys that actually went to LSU that I was supposed to start with, they flunked out and they joined the Marines. <laughs> so I would have probably ended up in the Marines no matter what, you know. But uh, it's, uh, I don't regret one second of it. You know, I, and I was fortunate after, after I got out the service, uh, I went to work for a, a chemical company down in the Gosma area, BASF, and I worked there for 30 years and I retired from there. And I've been retired 20 years now. So <laughs> I was very fortunate, you know, that uh, my life turned out the way it has. And uh, I can't leave out my spouse. She stuck with me from the beginning, from the, from the get-go. She's, uh, we've been married 51 years and uh, I put her through some misery. So, she, but she's hung in there, so that's important. Uh, most of the people, I've been to, to, the, to the wall up in D.C. several times. It, it never ceases to grab me every time I go up there. Uh, and it, what is hard to believe is, is you, you students look at me as an old man, which I am, but all of those names on that wall that's young folks, not much older than in, than y'all in here. I mean, they, uh, we had the wall came to Zachary one time, and I, that's what I try and tell the students who came there to look at the wall, that it was a moving wall, and I tell them, because I kind of walk the, the, the front of it, you know, and talk to people and let them know what it was about. And, but I say, when you look at those names, don't look at me. I say, those, those names on that wall, or were people who weren't much older than you. Probably, I think the average age over there was about 20 or 22 on the wall. Uh, I turned 22 years old over there and I was an old man. When I turned 22, I was the oldest guy in my squad. So all my guys were probably 18 or 19 years old that, that served with me. So they were a bunch of young ones. Uh, how many of you want to ask something that's probably more uh, controversial? Anybody? I'll ask some uh, if you're comfortable talking about it. As much as I mean, it's not, I get it. Uh, when you are, first, I guess two things. Number one, when you are under fire, what is that? I mean, because we'll never understand what that's like. And, and nobody will never understand it. I'm, and, I, and I don't say that lightly. It's, it's just something that when you have somebody out there shooting at you and trying to kill you, and that's what they're trying to do is kill you, uh, there's nothing like that that you will ever experience, you know. Uh, we got caught in a couple ambushes and just fortunately, we didn't lose a person. We were walking across a dike, and uh, I mean, the area I worked in, most people think of Vietnam as being the jungles. Where I worked at was nothing but rice paddies. I mean, for as far as you could see, it was just nothing, you know, and then you'd have a village, and they'd have hedgerows of, around the village, so you, to keep, uh, people from trash pant uh, going through too easy. But anyway, so when you cross these rice paddies, most of the time you sit up on one side and your point man or a couple guys would go across. And when they would go across, you would be sit, sit, uh, sitting there waiting in case they got caught in the fire. But most of the time the VC got a little wiser and they let people start getting out there. and. Uh, like I said, we got caught 
a couple times out in the open and you, the dirt was kicking all around us and it's just fortunate that they were such bad shots. They were terrible. They couldn't hit the side of a barn. And if I'd have had one Marine over there, he'd have got them all. I'm telling you, if they, he would have got them all. But uh, these guys were just bad shots. And so we were fortunate in that respect that, now they could set good booby traps though, you know, and they'd done that a lot. And uh, they had a lot of punji stakes in, the, in our area where we were at. And the villagers over there were, uh, I, don't, I won't say they were pro-VC, uh, but they didn't help us a whole lot either. So, and the women were just as bad as the men. I mean, you couldn't trust the women over there. They would hide the VC and uh, we actually had them shoot at us before. So, I mean, it was a war where you didn't know your, who your enemy was. You have any kids attack? Huh? You have any kids attack you? Uh, I never had them attack me, but they, they, they say that they had uh, in a couple incidents over there where uh, they actually had grenades and threw them at the buses. So, with the troops on them. So, we, they had, uh, they were always there. The little kids over there uh, were, the, were the ones who suffered the worst, actually. So, and we had our corpsmen with us. Our corpsmen were like medics that came in and, and helped take care of the villagers and stuff. We, uh, there was a, I'll never forget when I was on a patrol, we could hear kind of a wailing noise, you know, like somebody was really hurting. And uh, so we had the corpsman with us, so and it was coming out of one of the huts, so we, the corpsman went in there and we went in to check and it was an older woman in there, I mean an older lady. And uh, she had, I don't know what, she had some kind of breast cancer or what, uh, but I mean all of this was just rotten looking. And so the corpsman passed her up best he could and then we took her in with us to bring her back to one of the hospitals. But uh, the kids over there, uh, they had sores and stuff on them every now and then. So we, we tried to help the villagers as much as we could, you know, when we could. Uh, and we were going through a village one time, they had an old duck there and, and we killed the, the duck. We was, hard, we was hungry. <laughs> so uh, the old villager there, uh, he said, he was, boy, he was raising the devil at us because we killed his duck. And, but anyway, so we were we'll give him some piastres. That was some Vietnamese money. And he was happy as he could be he cooked the duck for us. <laughs> but, uh, you know, those people, they were very poor. They were very poor. Probably uh, what we made in a month was like their yearly salary, if they had a salary at all. Most of them just lived off the land, so. But uh, like I said, it was it's quite an experience. Anybody have anything? Okay. Uh, earlier we were talking about you know the news anchors and all these people that would not show up when it came to how people thought about y'all at home. Did they ever like really get in the way of things and make things more difficult when it actually came to them being out in the field with y'all? He's talking about so on the news how they painted bad pictures of you with their stories. When they were there, did they ever get in your way? Like the like CBS guy, was he in the way? Uh, no, they never really got in the way. They they just kind of hung to the side. But we had to protect them. That was our job to protect them, even though we didn't want to. <laughs> uh, I always, and it's a terrible thing to say, but if uh, I always said that if I knew Morley Safer was going to write that report, he wouldn't have come home. <laughs> uh, I'm telling you, it was, it was, he done us in, you know, and it was a bad report. And I just, I had no love for those people over there. They, uh, today on the internet, uh, I was looking at Jane Fonda. I know y'all all know Jane Fonda, but uh, there's no love lost on Jane Fonda amongst Vietnam veterans. Uh, 
during the war in 1972, she actually went to North Vietnam and posed with the North Vietnamese soldiers on a big old cannon that they had over there. And uh, the women, or some women organization up in uh, Sport of New York had elected her to some prestigious thing. And uh, the building that they have this award ceremony in, the, the town of Sport of New York had actually donated this to, these, to this organization and they, they, so they withdrew all their funding. They said, if you're going to put uh, Jane Fonda in this, we ain't supporting you no more. Because Jane Fonda definitely hurt the veterans when she did what she did. And, and no Vietnam veteran will ever forgive her for that. She apologized, but uh, apologies never has been accepted. Anybody else? Uh, what's the closest y'all ever been to the enemy when y'all was fighting? The closest? Close proximity. We've run into them. <laughs> at, like face to face. Yeah. At night, uh, my point man, uh, it was right about dusk and we was in a, a, a confined area and he came around the corner and this guy came around the corner. I mean, they were just like this. And they both startled each other so much they just, they just went to the side and the guy got away, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was just, but that's, you, you had pretty close contact with them. Uh, not all the time, but every now and then you did. This guy here, he was uh, my point man. Uh, his name was Johnny Strong. Uh, he was super, super. He. Uh, he was from Arkansas, and it don't matter what, at night, I could tell him, give him coordinates on a map, and say, we had to go out a thousand clicks this away, we got a checkpoint, a thousand clicks this away, and then come back in, and he was like a bloodhound. I mean, he, this guy was unbelievable how good he was. He was something. Uh, but. And he passed away a couple years ago. Uh, so, like, when y'all went to a village, y'all weren't like, y'all weren't like attacking the villagers. Like what now? Like when y'all went to a village and like y'all like went to the village and like y'all had to like destroy the huts and everything. Not all the time, but that particular one we did. So, like, y'all weren't always like fighting the villagers themselves. No, no. Uh, most of the time, when we went through the villages they didn't even pay no attention to it. The villagers that lived within the village, uh, we just, we would patrol through and we might be looking for some trap doors, uh, or like they had hay or something, or walk into the huts and stuff, you know, and look and see who's in there. But as far as uh, destroying villages, that particular village was destroyed for a reason, because we had taken so many casualties there before. So, that was uh, why that, that particular village was, but most of the time, a matter of fact, that's the only village that I can remember that we actually destroyed. And we, we, we took casualties at other points, but uh, that, that, was a, that was a bad village to start with. So uh, that was our objective, was to stop the, the killing there. So. And the reason we talked about that was because we talked about like my leg. Yeah, me later, lie. Later on, you know, all the stuff like that. Well, I say my leg. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all the other uh, instances where they did right. kill for just to kill, but that was later on. Right. When right. We were heavily into stuff like that. So he was early on enough to where it was probably yeah, still. I just didn't know if like they were all bad. Mm -hmm. No, no. Uh, and a lot of the a lot of the villages, like I said, they were they were just hard-working people, you know, but they were caught, it's just such a bad situation over there, they were caught in between us and, and the VC. Uh, one of the villagers, they had an old French fort over there that was in our area of responsibility and every night, we used to love to, when we got to go there because we actually got under sleep without sleeping in the rain or, the, uh, you know, under a roof, so to speak. 
and uh, every now and then we'd go in there and get some rest. But in that uh, in that place there, the, they had a little village right outside the French fort, and the uh, the chief of that village was helping us, you know, and and not helping the VC. And uh, the VC snuck into that village one night and uh, beheaded him. So, because he was helping us. And so that, that's the kind of situation they were in. You know, they, uh, we tried to protect him and the village, you know, but you couldn't protect them 24 hours a day. We had other duties too, so. But it was an inf unfortunate situation there, you know, where he got got caught like that. Sure, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, do you have anything else? I don't know how kind of to say it, but like where y'all were stationed in Vietnam, how far was that from where y'all actually caught? Uh, there was no front. Uh, wherever you was at was danger, you know. Um, and most of the time, we didn't have, they had what they call a, a secure area where the battalion was at, where it was probably 1,200 guys, something like that. But we operated uh, in, in platoons and squads, and that was probably 30 guys, 40 guys in a platoon after well, we'd lost a few. But that was, uh, then from that, we set up one patrol base, and from that patrol base, the squads would go out and patrol and come back in. You, were, you either went on a day patrol, a night patrol, or ambush every day. Every day you went on patrols. So uh, the night ambushes, uh, <coughs> You would normally go out of your lines right about dark, set up, and didn't come back in until the next morning. Your night patrol, you usually went out about dark and came back in probably three or four hours later. And then the day patrol was probably about a three or four hour patrol. If you weren't on patrol, you was in the perimeter standing guard. <laughs> and so you didn't get, I would say, we averaged maybe four hours sleep a day. And that, that was tops. You didn't get a lot of sleep over there. And the sleep you got, you was either under that little old tent or something like I got there. That, that poncho, you spread out something to keep the heat off of you. If it was in the early part when we got there, it was dry season. And then when the uh, monsoon started around October, September, October, it rained every day. I mean, you just, there was no way to stay dry. I smoked it when I was over there. My hands were gold as this envelope right here, maybe gold <laughs> from cupping my cigarette and smoking and when I was over there. And everybody smoked over there, but you, uh, you didn't know when your last smoke was gonna be. <laughs> so <laughs> we'd like to, everybody smoked. Well. I want to see the pictures that's passing around. Y'all will notice that the the water buffalo. Yeah, that that's what got me out of Vietnam. That buffalo gored me. The one that's in the picture. He uh, we were on a, a sweep, a search and destroy sweep. These things have uh, people think of Vietnam just bullets and bombs and all that, but there was a lot of hazards there. The water buffalo was one of them. How many of those did they have just around? Hmm? How many, how many did they have around? How many, were there a lot of buffalo just around? Uh, just about every, every farmer had one that they would plow their fields and stuff with. Uh, the kids rode them, but uh, this one here, we was on a patrol and we was on the sweep actually and I was checking the ID on the phone, one of the farmers there and the buffalo when I saw him he was coming right at me and I had my rifle and I, I, I couldn't get around I might have cut a round off but uh, we had a lot of troops in the area 
and he he gored me. He put a horn through this arm and both my legs. And uh, they put me on a chopper. They popped morphine to me and put me on a chopper. And uh, I stayed in the hospital in uh, Yakuska, Japan for three months. And uh, after I got out of the hospital, uh, they were going to send me back to Vietnam. And fortunately, uh, I had about a month and a half left to do. And fortunately, uh, and, and unfortunately, because sometimes I regret I didn't go back. Uh, but then I didn't, there was no guarantee I'd get to go with the same guys I had been serving with. So I didn't, I didn't much want to go and start with some new guys. But uh, they had a guy there that pulled me out of the line as they were cutting my orders and said, well, we're going to keep you right here on Okinawa. You don't have but a month and a half left. So I got to stay there. And uh, after I got home and I went to work at the plant, I almost didn't get hired on at the plant because of my wounds. And uh, I hadn't had any problem with them, but, but fortunately I hadn't. But I wasn't working there but maybe three months and uh, infection started setting in one of my legs. So I had to go up to the VA hospital in Alexander and I spent uh, about three weeks up there. And then about a year later, the same leg started giving me trouble again. And uh, I went up there and the doctor was going, talking about amputating my leg right below the knee. And uh, he said the infection had got in the bone. But, and the buffaloes were so nasty and the horns you can see the horns on that one, uh, in that picture. Uh, it just left a lot of infection. So I was fortunate that they were able to, to clear up the infection and never had no trouble since then. But he kind of scared me when he said he was going to take it off at the <laughs> below the knee there. I didn't, I didn't much care for that, that news. But I made it home. Done good, so. Well. Were together whenever you left? No. Medicine gas station. station after a basketball game. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> and sh you were 25, she was 18? Uh, yeah. Cool. So I was 24. Age, okay, my age was senior high school. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Back then. I mean, that's Marpaw, small town living. Uh, but uh, I guess one thing I want to ask that can be a little bit controversial um, and you don't have to go too much to it because I've heard a lot more than they'll ever hear from it but when you got back uh, how has it affected in terms of like PTSD um, well I think anybody that that served in combat has a certain amount of PTSD uh, I've, I've got a rating of some PTSD. I never realized I had it. Uh, I was going to the VA and uh, one of the doctors there recommended that I go see a counselor. So uh, I went and saw the counselor and we had several meetings. Uh, and he wanted to put me on some drugs, some anti-depression drugs or something like that but I told him I wasn't going to take no drugs so he, they were going to send me up to Arkansas to some kind of classes to help you with your, your, your PTSD and uh, I said I want to handle it myself and but it is something that is realistic uh, my wife was telling Adam uh, I was kind of bad to live with for a long time and uh, it's just uh, it's something that gnaws on you and uh, you, you, you can't get rid of it I mean you can through a lot of counseling and, and I've gotten better over the years for sure uh, but uh, I was a very heavy drinker, 
when I got out, probably up till I was 30 years old or older. And uh, like I said, I, uh, my wife put up with me. I, I fought with her at night, you know, and it was it was bad. But uh, and I think, like I said, I think any man or woman that fights and goes into combat and experiences death every day, you know, you. Uh, I feel very fortunate that I came home, you know, all in one piece. Uh, few holes punched in me, but I mean, uh, I made it home, so, uh, I, and there's a lot of guys that were a lot worse than me, uh, uh, this guy, uh, who was, I think, can't think of his name now, but anyway, his dad was probably the most famous Marine ever, uh, and his, he went into the Marines, and he stepped on a landmine right in the same area where we was working at. It was a big one. It blew off both his legs, one arm, the fingers on the other one, other, blew his eardrums out. And this guy actually became a senator in Virginia. Uh, and he, he fought back, but he, he wanted, his dad was such a famous man and he wanted to do his part too, but you can't live that life. But uh, he he suffered heavily from PTSD and it ended up committing suicide. Uh, but it was a terrible thing. And like I said, it is real out there. The PTSD is real, and uh, uh, you it's just you just got to deal with it, and it's tough. Anything at all? famous Marine you were talking about just now? <laughs> Puller. <laughs> Chesty Puller was his name. And his son, uh, I can't remember his son's first name, but anyway, if, if you ever have a chance, it's a, it's a book, uh, Fortunate Son is the name of the book. And it was written by Puller. And it's a, it's a great book. Great book to read. So. Anything else? How many of you have, uh, have had grandparents in this class that served? Oh, uh, good. Like I said, anybody that you see walking around, all these old people like me, and they wearing a cap like this, if, if you see them wearing a the cover, thank them for their service. I mean, they, um, it's, it makes them feel good, makes me feel good, you know, when I, when I see people and they thank me, I thank people. I, you know, I see veterans and I may not have nothing on that showing I'm a veteran, but I'll thank them, you know, I'll thank them for their service. Um, and whether they were in combat or not in combat is irrelevant. You know, they they did go serve their country and, and they done their, the right thing. Uh, draftees, uh, I don't think they even got a draft no more, I'm not sure. Do they still have the draft? Last time we drafted was Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, so, and and the, the Marine drafted very few. I know one guy of all the people that I've, I've been associated with that's been in the military. Only know one guy that was drafted in the Marines, and uh, he got he got one leg blown off and another one hurt bad. But uh, he's. He don't regret it. He said he he'd do it again. So, but uh, that's hard to believe. But that's the kind of that's the kind of uh, pride they instill in you. So I wouldn't give up none of none of my experiences for anything. Taught me a lot. So last round, any, anything? You receiving benefits once you got back? I didn't at first. I did, well, when I had to go in the hospital in VA in Alexandria, they started giving me, uh, I think it was $15 a month I got <laughs> for uh, <coughs> my wounds. Uh, and I missed, oh, I don't know how many days of work I ended up missing, but uh, <laughs> it wasn't a whole lot back then. But they, uh, I found out later, of course the VA don't tell you all this stuff, 
but uh, they, they don't give you no extra information. But when I was in the hospital, I was supposed to draw 100% disability when it's if it's service connected, which mine was, and uh, I didn't know nothing about it, and they didn't tell me nothing about it. They just paid me my fifteen dollars, and <laughs> so. Um, but I've learned since then. Last call. Well, I truly appreciate y'all listening to me rattle off up here. I, Oh.